Nehemiah 2. Nehemiah. Now, let me say I have to do this sometimes because if I went to a church service and the pastor didn't tell what's going on, uh, I'd be very confused. We're in the book of Nehemiah. I follow from Ezra into Nehemiah uh, because that's the way it goes. And I hope that as we're working in the Old Testament some right now, as the Lord leads, uh, that your life will be open to uh, the Old Testament, the Word of God, and that we will learn. And uh, so that's where we are, we're following up Nehemiah in chapter 2. Let's stand together, would we? I want to read about eight verses here. We will try to look through the whole chapter in basic parts, but I believe you'll get the message about being a leader. It is my prayer. Nehemiah chapter 2. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? Uh, this is nothing else but sorrow of heart. And then I was very sore afraid and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad? When the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire. Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant had found favor in thy sight, thou wouldst send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be? And when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, which appertain to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me, according to the good hand of my God upon me. May God bless his word. You may be seated. Who will be a leader? Who will be a leader? I found this little article by Jack Kemp, a former NFL quarterback and was a vice presidential candidate in 1996. Uh, he's relating to sports. I thought it's a very interesting statement about being a leader. Sports provide invaluable lessons in leadership. A leader is not defined solely by his position. Everyone's a leader in some way. In life, most spend a fair amount of time on the bench. But it doesn't mean we're not in the game. You don't have to be first stringers to have an impact. We're constantly influencing and shaping the lives of countless people. Let me ask you a simple question to begin with. Does your life, your words and your life have any influence on anyone else? Are you making a difference? As a Christian, it should be through Christ to other people. Did you realize a person in politics can be used of God? If you remember, we started with Ezra. The very first message I said from Ezra 1, King Cyrus of Persia had come over and conquered the Babylonians at that time in the 500 range of B.C.s there. 
It would be probably the 6th century, mid-6th century, or early 6th century, B.C. They had Israel captive, and the Lord God did a miracle in a pagan ruler's life. He said, now it's time for you to go back and build the temple. I've read about this. How would he have known to do that except God, the God of heaven, the God who created heaven and earth, the Lord God Almighty, would have moved in his soul and started sending the Jews back to the homeland. Then came another Jew later on named Nehemiah. He's in a high position of government. We found that out in verse 11 of chapter 1 here, Nehemiah 1. And in the first verse of chapter 2 we read, he's the king's cupbearer. I mean, this man is a very faithful servant of the king, Xerxes. I mean, if you're going to be a wine taster and a wine uh, giver from the, from the cups, you've got to be trusted. And he's got to have a lot of sense and a lot of, uh, a lot of love to even do such a job as that. A faithful servant. I would say also he was a friend. So we learned in chapter 1 last time that Nehemiah hears of his homeland, Jerusalem and Judah. A lot of suffering going on. Walls broken down. Gates are burned. And it said that he sat and he wept and fasted in chapter 1. And then he prayed. He sought the Lord in that great prayer he prayed. I want to ask you today, will you rise up and be a leader for God? Will you be a Nehemiah and step into the game and help go forward for the kingdom of God and of his son Jesus? First of all today, as you will see, a leader for God, as he steps into the game, learns to wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. Now we read verses 2, 1 through 3. Uh, you do not see this here as history accounts. But Nehemiah just didn't go from, in verse 11 of chapter 1, right into verse 2 the next day and give the king the wine and tell him his request and the problem of his heart. Some history accounts say he waited about four months before he shared his heart with the king. He had learned what was happening. He knew what was going on. He watched for the opportunity I, I want to say today there's something about praying for the right timing of life. Do you believe that? If you're right with God, he, he helps us and sometimes we still don't obey and we miss the right timing. I believe Nehemiah was a man who waited for the right time. That day he brought the wine to the king. Nehemiah had a sad face. Just picture you know what's happened back at your home, for example. And uh, his head is dropped, the tears may be trickled down his face, and the king knows there's something very different about Nehemiah. Most, li most likely, Nehemiah was a fine, uh, maybe a happy kind of guy, or friendly guy, you know, as a friend of the king. And he knew he wasn't physically sick, wasn't his head hurting, or his back hurting, or maybe a broken bone, he could look at him and tell that he was just like before except being sad. It must be in his heart. So Nehemiah knew that God's timing was right. Have you ever, ever wondered how it is that a coach, for example, on the sports scene could be coaching a baseball team, a football team, now football is cranking up and around the regions. How you could take one coach and he pours his heart into a, a team for this year and next year, and they, they lose. They have a, a very poor record. But then he's called to another team, and what happens? They rise to the top and become a winning team. How do you do that? We call it at the right time. Maybe the right timing. Nothing changed about the coach, really. It's the right time and the right place. What about a faithful man of God who loves Jesus? serves Jesus and gives his heart to the ministry that God doesn't move, doesn't do any mighty work. 
But he's called to a new ministry and he waits for the right time and God moves mightily. Waiting upon the Lord. We see in Nehemiah 2 too that Nehemiah believed it was time to approach the king. So he's walked with the Lord a long time. Now he didn't rush ahead of the Lord's timing. Doesn't mean he's not afraid. The Bible says he's sore afraid. I, I like the old English sore afraid. It means just he's very frightened. I mean, how would you like to pour out a request before a king? He doesn't really know, uh, know about you and your life. He just knows you personally, maybe. But what is the first words he says to the king? Let the king live forever. This shows his loyal service to the king. He honors the one who's over him. If the king didn't live, Nehemiah probably wouldn't live either. So he's always recognizing the king, putting him on, we call it a high pedestal. The time came to lay out the problem, this burden. Let me, let me paraphrase this, would I? Dear king, my home city, back in Jerusalem, the walls are broken down. People have just made a mockery of our city. The temple, the gates are all burned. It just looks like somebody's just taken the battery rams and and knocked them down and crushed them to pieces. People are sad. People are suffering at my home. I'm very concerned about it. And I'd like to go back and help build it again. You know, I remember our Lord Jesus, God's Son, talking about waiting. The Father sent the Son into the world to save the world, didn't He? He came and He lived and He served and He loved and He forgave. But He's always pointing to the kingdom of God. You ever remember Jesus in the Gospel saying, My time has not yet come? You remember that? Over and over again He'd say that. My time. What time are you talking about? Time to go to the cross. And die for the sins of the world. So, Jesus Christ, our greatest leader, he showed that he waited upon the Father. What about you today? Are you waiting for the Lord? A true leader will. Secondly, a leader for God learns to pray to the Lord. He learns to pray to the Lord. Now, I want you to listen very carefully to this. You say, where, did, where does pastor get this from? It, it's just a, a little statement. But I want you to notice something. Verse 4, the king said to me, For what dost thou make request? Now, what was the first thing that Nehemiah did? What does the Bible say? He said a prayer. Did he, did he say it before the king? Uh -uh. He, didn't say, he didn't say anything about audible. He didn't say it out loud. He didn't speak it. King never knew that he had called upon the Lord. Maybe he was afraid that he, didn't, he wouldn't recognize the Lord God of Israel. The true Lord God. But he didn't speak it. He didn't write it like he did in, in chapter 1. It was just silent, short, straight, specific. I call it the supersonic prayer. Uh, let's call it the rocket-fired prayer, you might say. Uh, let, let's suppose you're, you're standing there. We are standing there. And he begins to talk and he says, King, I, I've got a major problem. He said, but I, I, need, my, I need my friend, I need my priest, my, my preacher. Uh, preacher Don's coming, coming with me. And, and I want him to offer up a great prayer to my God. What do you think the king would have said probably? Whoa. Maybe he said, all right. So, Nehemiah says, Brother Don, say the prayer. So I began to pray. And one minute, and five minutes, and ten minutes. And the king falls asleep. That, that would be terrible, wouldn't it? I mean, he didn't do that. Think, think with me, in this critical moment, Nehemiah sent up a silent prayer. 
Do you ever have a silent prayer when you go places? Christian, are you living in the presence of holy God? Do you know him personally? That he is the way, the truth, and the life? No one comes to the Father but through Jesus. Do, do you know him? H have you met him today in his word? Have you, have you called out a silent prayer to the Father in the name of Jesus? You see, I believe the message here for us today in being a leader for God is our attitude of prayer. You don't have to go around and speak in long prayers. You didn't say anything about that. There are times we need uh, extended prayer, sure. Public prayers. How can this apply to us for a moment? Take school, for example, tomorrow. How many is going to school tomorrow? Lift up your hand. I mean, I'm talking about from college on. High school, kids and all are going to I mean, school. Well, let me ask you tomorrow, in one of your classes, maybe a history class or uh, whatever class it might be, a teacher says, you know this stuff about believing in God, that you young people ought not to do that. What are you going to do? Raise your hand and scream at the professor or teacher? No, you wouldn't do that. Or when you say, oh Lord, give my mind a heart for you. Do not let me waver. You know I trust you and love you. And would you help this teacher? You don't say that out loud. You don't go around and blast it out in a megaphone. You wouldn't do that. The Lord will give you strength and courage. How about your job? Many of you are going to the job tomorrow. Say you're going to a meeting and you're facing a great struggle to explain a problem. What are you going to say to the, to the leader? Hey, you. I don't believe that. You wouldn't say that. You could just lift up a silent prayer to the Father in the name of Jesus. Give you wisdom. In the life of the church, same picture. Brother Nehemiah is in the presence of the king who holds the highest office in the land. He's just a little man, little servant. Wonder what he said in the quietness of his heart. Just think for a moment. You imagine this. Lord, you're king above all kings. Please direct his mind. God of heaven, you're the only God. Please do your will in this matter. Simple. Simple. A leader for God prays to the Lord. Thirdly today, a leader for God, he will explain, he learns to explain and plan for the needs. Now this is 5 through verse 8. Nehemiah again recognizes the king. He doesn't run past the king. He knows the king is a leader. Nehemiah knows that the Lord's work will be done according to his will. He will get it done. So he explains his request, his first request, very simple and straightforward. I need to go back home to the land of Judah. Rebuild the walls and the gates. Very simple. Nehemiah, you've been a faithful man. You're the number one cupbearer. You've been with me for years. You're my friend. I'll be glad to send you. We find in verse 6 that Nehemiah gives and sets the time that he'll be gone. Request number two. Verse seven, he says, please send letters to the government officials of the other nations. Well, that's a very wise and thoughtful thing. Why would he do that? He needs protection. He's not going out by himself. He knows there are many across the different rivers and the different countries that they would pass through and need to be protected. Request number three, he asked for the supplies needed to build the timber, the forest. Do you know the forests were carefully guarded in those days by the king? 
and their people. You think about the first maybe environmental group online uh, stopping the, the use of the forest. But Nehemiah, the people would need the timber to build the walls. He said also you build a palace. Now this is not a real house palace. This was just a building next to the temple. It kind of was a guarding place for the temple. And then there was the wall uh, that had to be built. How often careful planning is overlooked by persons in leadership, even in the life of the church. Sometimes it's linked to false spirituality. You ever heard someone say, or maybe you've said, well, God told me to do that. And my reply would be, what did he tell you to do? Uh, how, how, do you, how does the Lord want you to do it? What can you share about it? person would say, well, I don't know. I guess I just start out and then we'll see what the Lord does. I don't know that's very helpful. Is that the Lord's plan? So many will start out doing a project for the Lord and forget to plan. They won't think through the questions. Where is it going to lead us? Do I understand it? What will it cost? What would be the process to be used in this situation? In the life of the church, uh, many individuals, many families sometimes will enter ministry without thinking about the cost of following Jesus. We must think through the plans, learn what it means to explain and make the plans. Number four, a leader for God I want you to stay close here. It's a very beautiful part here. Very powerful. A leader for God learns to depend first on the Lord. Are you dependent on the Lord? Look with me in verse 8, would you? In verse 8. And I'll show you three, three parts here. And the king granted me the last part of verse 8. Well, what does it say the king granted me? According... To the good hand of my God upon me. Look over to verse 12. What my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. And also, verse 18. I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me. Now, King Artaxerxes heard the needs, heard the explanation of Nehemiah, and he agreed with him. But note something about Nehemiah. He knew this earthly king was under the direction of the heavenly king, the almighty king, the Lord God. According to the good hand of my God, Christian brothers and sisters, those who know Jesus, are you walking with the Lord? What does a great hymn say? When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still for all what's going to happen. For all what? Who will trust and obey. Say that. Who will trust and obey. Are you doing it? Are you doing it today? It's dependent first on the Lord. God's hand, we mentioned that several weeks ago, even with uh, Ezra, uh, the priest. We speak of the gracious presence of God. His hand directing us, pointing us out. It's His presence with us. Uh, his guiding wisdom. He leads us. Think of this. As Christians here today, there are many of you who lead for Jesus in the kingdom of God. But we have different ways of leading. We have different ministries we're called to. Everyone is not the same. He doesn't call you to do that. I ponder these ideas for a moment. Pastor, why don't you preach and teach like the young man I heard six months ago? He never uses notes. You know what I say to him? Sir, I'm so glad 
that God gave him a wonderful mind better than mine. The person has a great memory. It's wonderful. A teacher, you teachers here, I want you to listen to this tape. Why don't you copy this teacher's, teacher's design, uh, style? God didn't make me the same cookie cutter mold as you. You see, Nehemiah was a leader for God's rebuilding ministry. He never says that Nehemiah was any kind of the preacher, a priest. He never claimed to be that. He was a builder. He was a great contractor, you might say. But his first dependence was on the Lord. I think of the Lord Jesus, the leader of the church. In John 5, it says that he went about doing what the Father has done. You, you can read in that. As the Father worked, I'm working also. He heard from the Father. He believed it and he did it. He depended on his Father. What about us today? He depended on the Lord? The Lord Jesus. Number five today, a leader for God. He was stepping to the game of life. So he learns to focus on the goal. Focus. Focus. You might call this catching vision, looking outward, giving it away. In our verses 11 through 18, Nehemiah has arrived now in Jerusalem. He knows what he's heard about at the walls and the gates, but he hasn't seen anything. And Nehemiah realizes who's in the center of this whole project. He's not going to tell the men anything who are with him. He's not saying anything to anybody. And he said as he goes out at night to survey, to inspect. He gets on his animal. I guess he's probably a horse. I presume it's something like that. He makes his tour around the wall. It's broken down, split apart, decaying. Gates are burned. Black as smut. Broken all to pieces. Those beautiful gates. He can't even make his way around, it says in the scripture there, verse 14, uh, by riding the horse. He has to get off, I guess. He starts walking. He makes his way around. He doesn't tell anybody, though, when he gets back. He doesn't tell the priest or the rulers. He tells them nothing. But we pick up at verse 17. He opens up. He has his focus on mind. He knows what's happening. He calls the group together. He shares about the walls and the gates. It's time for us to build. Look at verse 17, would you? You see the distress that we're in, how Jerusalem lies wait, waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more a reproach. Uh, Brother Nehemiah said, God's name in his house should be a place of praise and worship to the Lord. Our walls... Our city is, is just being demolished. We have no protection. The people suffer. It's time to rise and build. And then verse 18, he focuses on the goodness of God. He knows God's in it. There's that picture again. We spoke about the hand of God. It's upon me. You know, there's real encouragement in that. It tells how God has worked in the king's life and the people very much have caught the vision now. He said, they say, they say, he didn't say it. Let us arise and build. This is a God thing. It's, that's a paraphrase of mine. God thing, it's a blessed work. We got to get about doing it. So Brother Nehemiah shared the vision and the people stepped out. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Proverbs 29 and 18. God sometimes uses one person's dream, their outlook, lies over the horizon, you might say. And God puts the seed there. And He can accomplish something special for the Lord. He shares it with others. And we trust the Holy Spirit to impress that upon others. 
that they would have similar thoughts. Now we find in verse 19, the enemy raises its ugly head. There's three names here, Sanballat, Tobiah, uh, Geshem. Just a pagan group from the other land. Scorners, despisers, mocking God, mocking the people. You see, the devil always has his crowd. The God of this world is at work. He has his evil team out there. Do you believe that? Do you understand that? He makes us, he, he wants us to be deceived and tricked. We don't know what took place, but we know this. In verse 20, what happens to the focus of Brother Nehemiah? Then answered I then. That's, that's the scorners. That's the, the pagan group. The God of heaven will prosper us. Therefore we as servants will arise and build. But you have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. Let's, let's paraphrase this. Listen, dudes. We are servants of the living Lord God of Israel. The God of heaven. We're here to do His work. Doesn't matter what you say, what you're going to do. You're not invited. You will not take part. You have no place with the people of God. He left it. We'll find out later what takes place after that. Nehemiah and the people of Israel come together as he's a leader for the Lord. And he leads them to the be to build the walls and the gates. Let me ask you, dear friends, you going to be a leader for God? You remember I said something about listening and obeying God, depending on God? Are you doing that? You're waiting for the Lord to move in your life? Do you really know Him today? Think of this in John 17, 3. And this is eternal life. That they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. John 17 and 3. Do you believe that? That's eternal life. You know him through the Son, Jesus. I ask you today, do you know him personally as your Savior, Lord? Do you trust Jesus Christ as a leader of your life? If he's not the leader, then you can't lead for him. You might lead other people to do things, but you can't lead for the Lord. Unless you know him. You need to come to the cross. Humble yourself. We said earlier, our greatest leader, Jesus, came from heaven's glory. Came to this earth, died. A cruel death. Suffered our sins, paid our punishment. Put your sins upon himself on the cross. He loves us. Died, rose again, and he lives to prove it. Do you know him? You can trust him. Then today, if you want to be a part of our church family, you know the Lord Jesus, trust him as Savior Lord, been baptized, you can come into his church family by transfer of membership, statement of faith, do you want to follow Jesus through this church family? Maybe you need to come and pray like Nehemiah did or just pray right where you are this morning, simply, surely, and call out upon the Lord.